Welcome, fellow travelers. This is episode 66 on Streets and Eats, and today we are taking you to Italy, one of our favorite regions, Cinque Terre. Welcome to Streets and Eats, the travel and food podcast dedicated to taking our listeners to the sights, sounds, and flavors of fascinating places near and far, both on and off the beaten path. We're Jim and Corinne Vale, and we've been traveling internationally and domestically together for decades, visiting more than 90 countries in all 50 states in the USA. We'll share all of the local knowledge and food expertise we've gathered through years of living as expats in Asia and Europe, as well as traveling with families spanning multiple generations around the world. Join us each week for a new adventure. Okay, so I have a question for you. When we were in Cinque Terre, we tried a dish that was highlighted on the movie Luca by Disney. Can you think of what that dish was? Well, I know Luca was like this amphibious boy. Mm-hmm. My first choice was going to be some kind of fish dish, like sardines or something. But I don't think sardines would have been featured on the They are movie. known for their salted anchovies, I believe. In right. the area. Yeah, anchovies. But that was not the answer. So in that case... I would have to go to one of the dishes that surprised me the most when we were there, because it's something that I didn't really like before having it there. And I'm not sure I still like it, but I did like it there. And that was a pesto. (laughs) And that was the same for me. It was exactly the same. Um, When we were going to the Liguria area, we had read up that the pesto there, the basil, the basil that pesto is made from, is so special that it has its own designation in the world because oh, of right. the of the way it's grown in the terroir, as they say for wines. I don't know if it's the same for right the terroir for, for basil for basil or not. But anyway, so it's a really special basil, and they're very famous for knowing their pesto. And that's right. So the favorite pasta dish in the, in the house that he lives in. I think when he becomes a real boy for a while is called Trenete al al Pesto. I'm sure if you speak Italian, that is not correct. But Trenete supposedly is um, a kind of flat spaghetti. Mm -hmm. And then al Pesto, the pesto is the sauce. And when we had ours, we had ours at this little restaurant in the town that we were staying in, Bonasolo. And there was nobody in the restaurant except for us. It's kind of a shoulder season, almost off season, actually. It was almost off. They were closing up. I think they were pretty much ready to shut down the restaurant for the whole season. But we were the only ones there. And so we were lavished upon and it was really nice. Um, But they said their specialty is the pesto. And both you and I are kind of like, we don't want pesto. But we did it because we knew it was was a specialty, right? And OMG, I thought it was fabulous. It was so good that I thought about how, I think I did have it again, didn't I? The next day. Yeah, someplace else. It was so good. (laughs) It was really good. And because we were the only ones there, they spent all this time with us. Uh, the one of the waiters was like, oh, you really like the pesto. Well, let me tell you all about how we make it and where it comes from and this and that. And yeah, so that was really fascinating. That was also the only restaurant that I've been in where I had to taste the wine and send it back. Right. Do you remember that? I remember vividly. They were, they were aghast. First of all, they didn't really believe me. They're like, what? There's nothing wrong with the wine, but it was definitely off. And they brought it back. I'm sure they tasted it in the back room. They didn't do it in front of us. And then they came out very apologetically with another bottle of wine. Brand new that they opened in front of us. Which was not the same one we ordered, but they said, we would enjoy better and was definitely a better wine. Yeah. Maybe even a higher price than I would have ordered. So folks, you know how you just automatically take that sip and expect that the wine is going to be good. Well, we have had one instance in all the wine tastings that we've done, but (laughs) one instance where the wine was actually bad and we sent it back. But you know what I found out too, Hmm. that the, they're so proud of their basil, their basil, however you want to say it. Basil, basil. That they put Buzzy. it on everything. They put it on focaccia. They put it on um, salads. They put it in sandwiches. They put it in all kinds of things, including gelato. Wow. And we did not. I have, you know, you hear about basil in ice cream and gelato and in desserts in general. Of Especially with lemon paired with lemon. Mm-hmm. That's but supposed to be a, a good combination. This is just plain old basil gelato, gelato. Sometimes it is paired with a berry, which 
I think sounds delicious. Yeah. But I we didn't try, try that. So now we have something to add to our ever growing list of things to do. List of odd ice creams that we've tried. Yeah. Like wasabi. That's my favorite for strange ones. I think wasabi was really good. I enjoyed the beetroot. It was really good um, in Poland. In Poland. What else have we had that's really kind of strange? Oh, we had garlic ice cream in States. No, I'm going to say that favorite. was not my favorite. And I've had Tabasco ice cream. That's also not my favorite. No. Um, I'm trying to think of a few other weird ones that we've had. We've had some strange Brat ones. Bratwurst. Oh, well, we had pork. bratwurst. That was, pork that was ice cream. not only not my favorite, but maybe my least favorite Definitely of all time. My least favorite. <laughs> so it does have a superlative. Yuck. <laughs> well, my favorite way for basil in a salad, of course, is the caprese salad, which is what it's just slices of fresh tomatoes, fresh mozzarella sliced, olive oil drizzled on, and maybe some balsamic. And pieces of basil leaves around Or just it. a margarita pizza. Or just a margarita pizza with fresh basil on it. Mm. But that's not, we've never had those, did we? I don't know. I think we did have a caprese with um, the local basil while we were there. But we probably didn't have a margarita pizza because we were busy eating all kinds yeah, of other things. Right. And we didn't really find out about the DOCG, the designation for the basil until the pesto dinner. So if we had it other places, maybe we wouldn't have known if we were getting the basil from the Liguria region or not. Liguria, is that how you say it? Le, it's an I. Liguria. Le, I don't I know, know how they say it. Liguria. 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 I don't know. I really don't know. So please. It's a good don't. movie though. I really like Luca. I thought it was a good movie too. I mean it's Disney. It's usually pretty good. Oh come on, you fell but asleep on, during it. I fall asleep during every movie. That doesn't mean <laughs> I don't true. like them. <laughs> Anyway, so today we're talking about the Cinque Terre region of Italy. And the reason I brought up Luca is because some of the scenes are of the towns that are right there hanging on the coast with their colorful, Disney-esque, colorful buildings, which were not inspired by Disney. They came about in Disney the 1970s. Yes, exactly. So anyway. And they don't really ever say in the movie that this is Cinque Terre or they don't name any of the actual villages, I don't think. But it's very clear once you've seen the movie. And after you've been and there. And you go there, that those little seaside villages are certainly the inspiration. Well, and plus, you know, he goes up and down so many hills and off the cliffs. And that is Cinque Terre to that a T. definitely <laughs> is. <laughs> Get it? To a T. To a CT to be good. To be okay, exact. so where is it? Where is Cinque Terre? Yeah. Well, I have a cute little story about okay. that. I wasn't sure if you were going to tell the story or not. I, I had it too, but you go ahead and tell Well, it. our friend, her name is Patty, and she taught with us when we were living in um, both actually in Turkey and then in Germany. We taught in two schools together. I was telling her that I was going to Cinque Terre for the weekend. And she goes, oh, it's so hard to find. We looked for it. We couldn't find it. I'm like, excuse me? What? You drove all the way there and you had to turn around you couldn't find it and she's like yes it doesn't exist there's no Cinque Terre I'm like you do know that Cinque Terre is not the name of one place right it is a collection it's an area it's got five towns she looks at me with these wide eyes kind of a blank stare she's like no I didn't know that I said well we do so I think we'll be able to find it (laughs) And we did find it. Well, but I thought that was so funny. They made a whole weekend of going down there looking for it and they never found it. Right. And leaving, you know, driving from Germany to get down there on a weekend is pretty ambitious anyway, but it's doable. But part of their problem also was that I think they were in a car. And like you said, they were expecting to see signs for Cinque Terre. And you don't see the signs for Cinque Terre. There are no signs. You cannot drive to all the villages. Um, I think you can drive to them and to park. One, one or two. You can actually get close to. Um, but for the most part, you got to take a train in or walk in or a boat. Well, you know how people, well, I live in Southeast Asia. So this is, this is just so Asian in a lot of ways, but it's all around the world. Really. You'll find a place that says no cars allowed, no motorized vehicles allowed. It's a pedestrian walking area. And then you have a car parked right there or yeah. a truck unloading something or a motorcycle comes whizzing by. 
um, no, that's that's a motorized vehicle and it's where I'm supposed to be. And this has happened all over the world. It happened when we lived in Germany. It's happened here. Numer- well, here, I don't even know if they have such a thing as a pedestrian only zone. But anyway, there it is pedestrian only. And it was very clear that it was pedestrian only and there it was car free when all the deliveries you saw these hulks of these men, although not all of them are big. I felt sorry for the younger, littler ones who were paying their dues, I guess, before they bulked up. But anyway, they had these metal carts. I mm-hmm. would call them like a shopping cart, except they were stronger than a shopping cart. They were, you know, full metal on the sides and they had big wheels and they were the wheels were made for going down those cobble street, uh, cobblestone streets and things like that. And that's how they got their deliveries. Mm-hmm. So whether they were getting it off the train or if they were going to the actual parking lot, wherever the parking lot was, and taking them from there or from a boat, I mean, from any number of ways that you can get in the city that is not by car, they were then doing it on foot with a cart. So I figured if the delivery people are actually not using cars and trucks and whatever, then it actually is car free. And I have to say... I love it's really nice. I love a pedestrian zone. I yeah. love a place where you can just walk and not worry about someone running you over. Well, and the lanes are so steep and narrow anyway that you'd have a hard time with any type of motorized vehicle there. The bicycles on Luca, I don't really I don't really buy that. Riding the bicycles up those hills, oh my gosh. Although I mean they were kids. They were kids, and I used to ride up some mountains on my bicycle. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, it's really nice to have it pedestrian zones. And we're not just talking about the hiking paths in between, because that's that's what you do there. You go there to hike between the different villages and along the coast and up into the mountains around them. So um, where? So where is Cinque Terre? Cinque Terre. It's, oh, did we actually answer We the didn't question? answer the question. I told the story and we got so off the western, uh, the western coast of Italy in the north between... Genoa and La Spezia. Yeah. Neither of them are that far. In fact, um, Genoa is really close and it's a pretty big city. And plus it has ferries to one of our favorite places. We took a ferry out of there once to Corsica, which we might talk about in a future podcast. But La Spezia is well known for being a jumping off point for the, the five areas, the five lands of Cinque Terre. And a lot of people stay there. Um, as opposed to staying within the five towns. We did not stay there because we wanted to be closer. More in um, it. But we are basically were one town out of Monterosso, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, that was in a town called Bonasola. And it was just as pretty. It had, just like the other towns, it had beautiful little cove and a beach. Uh, the restaurant we ate at that we were talking about was right on the beach. Our hotel now downtown and all the towns were as packed. And we went at the end of October. Yeah. There was a lot of people. Still. There were still a lot of people. It was, it was definitely not high season. High season would be even worse than that. Like we were able to find places to sit for lunch and there were places on the beach. I think in midsummer that would be hard to do. It would, yeah. Um, but even still, even though, um, it was busy in all the places in our little hotel. There was like a total of 10 people. Yeah. At, two other groups. At most. Yeah. And we had a fabulous breakfast. It was, we had a great place to park the car for the whole time we were there. It worked out. Fabulously. It was really a good way to do it because we were driving. So we were basically able to drive right to the edge of Cinque Terre, the region. The hotel was right at the train station. Yeah. That was the one draw so for we could it too. Walk right to the train station, and we were in Monterosa, and we were in Monterosa like within I think it was a five minute, six minute train ride. It was close. It was very close. So yeah, a lot. Also, Pisa is about the same distance as Genoa on the other side, heading south, and so people going to Pisa, you can uh, make a day trip from Pisa or into, Florence into the, uh, Cinque Terre, or from Florence as well which are also really popular destinations. I mean, that's something people always want to know. Can you do Cinque Terre on a day trip? And I would say you can, because even if you walk the whole long length of between the towns, it's about 12 kilometers, which by the way, 
still will take you five, six, maybe even seven hours, depending on if you're like me and want to stop and take a million pictures, want to stop and have a little snack here, want to stop and put oh, my yeah. feet in the water, um, all that kind of stuff. And depending on how fit you are, how and, fast you're going to go. And everything else that goes along. Because it is up with. and down and up and down. There's only a few areas that are, that are straight stretches. And a lot of it's unpaved as well. A mm -hmm. lot of it is paved, but a lot of it is unpaved, maybe 50-50. But anyway, can you do it in one day? The answer is you, you can. You absolutely can do it. You can take an early train, get up there, hike the path, you know, get on the train and go back. It will be A, a very long day, mm -hmm. B, a very tiresome day, and, and C, you won't have actually gotten to really enjoy going downtown into the cities. Having lunch in those cute little towns. I mean, they have the cutest little eateries. One place that we stopped at, we'll have to look up and put in the show notes the name of the place. It was literally the size of what? Four feet, five feet wide and maybe 10 feet deep. It was like a little, unlike someone's hallway, basically. Yeah. And they did, I don't believe they had any tables inside. Maybe they did, but I don't, I don't remember any. We sat outside under a little awning and we had the best charcuterie platter mm. I've ever had in my life. I mean, with salamis and little antipasti. and yeah, all antipasti. the antipasti. It was so good. Yeah. I love that. That's a good way to do it. And it, for lunch, especially it's a good way to do a lunch because you get so many things to try and you're going to get filled up. You don't even have to order a main dish or, or anything more than that. So that's really nice. Okay. So anyway, you can do it in a day trip. I wouldn't suggest it. No. I take at least, at least two or three days, two or three days, because I just think it's a great place to explore. And there's lots to see in the little region and the towns are so cute. And if you're, if you want to see any of the sites and go shopping at all, or go swimming and go to the beach, that's going to take up time that you wouldn't have on a yeah, day trip. Yeah, you're going to want that time. And like other places around the world that get very crowded from tourists that are coming in during the day. Right. It's super cool to be there at night when a lot of those people go home. Now, a lot of people do spend the night in one of the villages in the Cinque Terre region. So it's not like it completely empties out. But it's like significantly different. But yeah, it definitely it definitely dies down quite a bit. And so you get to kind of wander around and, and just experience it when it's a little quieter. And especially during the summer when it's hot during the day, it's cooler at night. And there are some really fantastic sunsets. Yes. The sunsets were when we were are there. beautiful. Every night, the sunset was just incredible. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely want to be there for sunsets. Too. Plus the wines in that region. Mm -hmm. Yum. Yeah. They're delicious. And so you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, drink wine and then have to worry about stumbling to anywhere hundred that kilometers point. back to your hotel, wherever it happens to be or 50 kilometers or whatever. So there are five towns that make up the five lands of Cinque Terre and they are Venazza, Manarola, Rio Maggiore, Cornelia and Monterosso. And I did not say those in the order of north to south or south to north or anything that like that. That was just a random naming? Just a random naming. <laughs> um, I think m I had a couple of favorites. We did not actually go into the middle of Cornelia that much because Cornelia is up on the hilltop. It's supposed to be really pretty, but we were already doing the 12 kilometer walk the day that we were near there. And we were like, we are not climbing those extra stairs. Um, and the, so, but we did really enjoy the other four towns quite extensively because we wanted to spend time in each of them. And plus, I think the, the path to Cornelia was washed out. Was that the one that was there washed out? There was a out? section. And, and if you're going to go hiking in the area, uh, make sure you do the research beforehand and check the trails that you're planning on hiking because, yeah, because it is such a, a steep area with cliffs and on mountainsides. Heavy weather can certainly wash out a trail very easily. And at the time we were there, there was a trail that was washed out. I think that was the one. So we started out in the one of the little towns, I believe it was Vernazza. And we went up to a walk up. I mean, just because we have to eat it like it, you know, 15 times a day. We walked up into this basically a little fry, a frito, is that what it's called? A little fry place, a friteria, I don't know what it's called. 
Um, but basically it had, you got a cone, a paper cone full of calamari mm. that was all fried up. It was, oh, French kiss. Crispy it was and delicious. tender. Delicious. Delicious. Mm. So fresh. And that was kind of like, I mean, it wasn't our breakfast because we had breakfast at the hotel. But, I mean, it was kind of like our second breakfast before mm-hmm. we went on the hike. <laughs> and it got us going. That was our fuel up for the hike. Yeah. That was in Vernazza, wasn't it? I think it was in Vernazza, and yeah. We, and my favorite hike was the one from Vernazza to Monterosso. It was steep. We had to walk up and then hike up the, basically a mountain and then back down into Monterosso. I really liked that one. And the views because you did get so high above the villages was just incredible. It was incredible. Oh, and my other tip for hiking it is if you have the time, hike both directions, not necessarily like go to one end and then turn around, come right back, but try to hike both directions because the views are just significantly different both ways. If you can't hike both directions, turn around frequently. How are the views different? Because when you're hiking, you're looking ahead. And so you see what's ahead of you, but you don't see what's behind you. So as you're climbing up out of Vernazza, for instance, if you don't stop and turn around, the best view of Vernazza is from that hillside, leaving the village and heading towards Monterosa. Even though I agree with you, that's the best view of Vernazza. I cannot imagine any person not turning around there. I can't imagine. Uh, Well, I can remember like a couple of turns in the trail where we stopped and turned around and we're taking pictures and people would walk by us and then kind of think about it and then turn around to see what we were taking pictures mm-hmm. of. He's right about that. I, I have and to go, that Oh, that's a great picture. And then they would take the same picture we were taking. Yeah. Yeah. So stop frequently as you're climbing out of the village uh, just to look around, take in the view. And, and the path, the trail was very Completely different in all different parts. You went from a paved flat area to stone steps going down, 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 and then up, 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 up. You went on through vineyards that were like, was a little path. It was only like, what, 15 inches wide or so. That was all dirt. I mean, it was, it surprised me on how much different it was throughout the day. Mm Mm-hmm. It was just completely different. It was just really beautiful. And that, by the way, did you know that that national park, Cinque Terre National Park, was the very first national park in Italy? Really? I not not only that. is it the fir- the first, but it's also the smallest. Oh, wow. And it's to protect the unique views and, you know, the whole area in the place because it's just, and it's so worth it. But I thought that was kind of cool that it was the first one. I don't know if we knew that when we were there. Uh, yeah, I don't <laughs> it also so. is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. We did know that because we always know when something's a UNESCO yeah, World Heritage we're always Site. One, we're always wanting to check out the UNESCO sites if we can. As you know, since we have a couple of podcasts on them so far, and we will have more in the future, I'm sure. Okay, so we said one day probably isn't enough. I would say if you have two full days, that would be enough. But you're better off having like a little bit of a day a whole two nights and then a little bit of a day and then you really know that you've gotten the most out of it and you can spend as much time as you want pretty much i mean they're small towns yeah but there's still things to do in them and like i said if you want to go to the beach it's pretty nice and they're close enough and easy enough to get around that you don't need to necessarily start at one village or one town spend the night there, make your way to the next town, spend your night there and keep moving to different places to spend the night. You don't have to do that. Getting around the region is super easy. Yes. Hiking is wonderful there. And that's the main reason you're going there, but there's a regional train that cuts straight parallel along the coast through all the towns, through tunnel after tunnel. Um, So that's the best way to get around. It's super cheap. It's and the cheapest it only way takes and quickest way to get from one town to the next. And the other thing you can do, which we did all the way, well, first of all, you have to remember that when you're hiking Cinque Terre, you don't have to pay to go into the national park, but you do have to pay to actually hike. And I think that's kind of like a travel insurance type of thing that you're paying because mm-hmm. if you do get hurt, they need to be able to get in there and get you out. So, so there is a fee for hiking the trail, and you can get a one day hiking 
pass or you can get a two day. So they don't really expect people to hike more than two days in a row. Right. Um, so there is that to take into consideration. And also the thing that we did that we really, really enjoyed was you can get a ferry boat from one end all the way to the other. That will stop at all five towns, but you don't have to get off. If you get a day pass, you might as well stop and get off and you can go do whatever you want. But if you're only going just one way, stay on the boat, depending on which way you're going, sit on the side that has, you know, from the front, that's going to be up against the, on the land side, the land side and get your camera ready because the views are spectacular. Yeah. Spectacular. Yeah, that's the best way to see the villages really is from the sea, I think. Well, to photograph that those iconic shots where yeah. you get, you know, that whole sweeping in of the cove or the harbor and the buildings coming all the way down to it. Otherwise, you're on top of the hill and you get a portion of it or you're right there on the inside of it. So you're only getting parts of it. But if you're doing it from the water, you're getting much more wide landscape. Yeah. So it's, a it's bit really further pretty. Out, you can see the whole town compose a shot. Yeah. That's a great way to do it. You can also do that. The ferry boat, instead of getting a full day pass, you can get a half day pass and just do it for half a day. It's a little bit cheaper. Yeah. But if you only do it for half a day, you're not gonna be able to stop probably at all five towns and walk around. Well, yeah. And for sure, I don't think you would have the time to like get out everywhere. And get so back what on. we did, and and not to say that what we did is the best way to do it, but we felt it was probably the best way to do it as far as money goes, and as far as getting to time see everything, and everything else. time is we took the ferry the whole way from one to the end. Then we took the train in between the other ones as we went to them because, like Jim said, they're right in the middle of town. They're easy to get to. They're cheap, and it takes just a matter of minutes. So you can easily do everything that you want to do and not spend tons of money because I mean, Cinque Terre is a very popular tourist site. It's not the cheapest thing to do in Italy. It's not the most expensive either, but it's not the cheapest, especially if you stay in the towns, you're going to be paying a pretty high premium Premium, probably for hotels. Just stay in our one town over. We probably cut our costs in uh, cost by at least a third, if not, Close to a half. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the reason we picked that place. Not only because we could drive into it. Which is a major consideration. Which is a good consideration if you've got a car. um, But because of the cost and because we knew that the train would take us everywhere in the region that we needed to go quickly and cheaply. So why not do it that way? Uh, Yeah. It it worked out really good. And Bonasola, the town we stayed in, while it's not technically one of those towns, like you're saying, is a beautiful little seaside village with the same colorful colorful houses and buildings. It wasn't exactly the same, um, but it was a pretty cool little Italian seaside village to stay in. Yeah, I agree. And there's other towns around there too, that are just as quaint. I mean, Italian towns are just beautiful in they and really of themselves, are. no matter where you go. So we went in the fall and a lot of times people ask, well, what's the best time to go? And Spring and fall, I really think are the best times. If you can go during the shoulder seasons, you're going to have fewer people there. Of course, Uh, the hotels will be a little bit less expensive, a little bit, not a whole lot. Um, But if you go in the off season, of course, there will be a lot less people there. But then because it is such a touristic place, you'll run into things where cafes and restaurants might be closed and hotels and hotels. Yeah. Two for that matter might be closed. The ferry doesn't run as often. Uh, the train schedule might be a little bit different. So those are things to think about. Summer- However, I don't think that that should stop you. If you can go in the off season, I think you would enjoy it just as much. It does get chilly. I mean, you would need to be, wear warmer clothes. But that hike is is taxing. I mean, yeah. you're going to warm up on that hike. So. The cooler the weather, the better, I think. Yeah. Summertime, there's a lot of people there. It's hotter. You can swim. There's some really nice beaches in the area. There are, but I would say that about spring. I You can swim probably from end of June. The water warms up all the way, probably through October. Yeah, I mean, we, was... we got in, in the water just with our feet. We didn't actually go swimming. I don't think we brought our swimsuits. We didn't, but we did see some people who were swimming. But there were plenty of people swimming, and the water is still warm. The water is warm more towards the fall and it's not as warm in the spring. Right. So if, if if going in the water is one of your goals, 
then you want to wait until after June. So then you might want to go in the fall. Mm -hmm. But if you're just looking for a shoulder season or where it's a little bit cooler, the flowers will be beautiful in spring. And so you'll have that and you you just won't be able to. Well, I mean, you can go in the water if you don't mind cold water, but just keep that in mind. But yeah, I mean, I think the time that we went was actually quite nice, but I was surprised at some of the towns and how many people were still there at the end of October. It was a weekend too. So if you could do it on a weekday, it might be better as well. That's true. I mean, these are just common, I I think, common tips and common sense for travel in general. Exactly. Well, at at any rate, I'm going to say that we must have had one of the best weekends of our life going to Cinque Terre. We'd also been to the Amalfi Coast and we love the Amalfi Coast. It's beautiful, but I think it's exorbitantly more expensive because that's where the rich and famous go. Um, It's a completely different experience there. You, you pretty much have to drive or take a Vespa. You're going to take ferries out to Capri, things like that. The, The hotels are more spread out. And they're expensive all along the way. Whereas in Cinque Terre, as we were saying, you've got that core group of those five towns that are pretty expensive. But then anything outside of that is going to be a lot cheaper. Um, I think overall, I enjoyed them both for totally different reasons. Yeah, for sure. Um, But I would probably lean at recommending someone go to Cinque Terre before Amalfi Coast just because Amalfi is really overdone really like extra touristy even more so than Cinque Terre yeah yeah I, I think I agree with you and it, it's super easy to get to from anywhere if you're going on a trip to Italy no matter where you go you're going to be able to find your way to Cinque Terre for at least a day or two so don't pass it by definitely get there and there's a lot of neat things to see in the area like we um, went over to Luca for a day. Like I said, we took a ferry out of Genoa to go to Corsica, which was just fabulous. Um, we we did a lot. Of, and plus Florence and Pisa are not right that there. far from there. And both of those are big cities to go to that are really nice. So so really look at going to Cinque Terre when you're planning your itinerary for Italy. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Streets and Eats. If you liked what you heard, please show us some love. Hit the like button and leave us a review. Maybe even subscribe so you don't miss any future podcasts. Also, we'd love it if you joined us on our Facebook private group, Streets Neats, where we just have an ongoing conversation about all things travel. Ciao for now.